everybody to session five of our study of the book of Acts. Great to have you tonight. Uh, we'll just pray. Lord, hallelujah. You're the King of kings and you're the Lord of lords. And may your anointing be upon us tonight and give us insights and inspiration as we look at the wonderful life of the great Apostle Paul, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ah, well, I trust you got um, your maps, uh, which will help us go with the journey of where we are going. Just to refresh our memories a bit, um, a probable chronology of Paul is that he was converted about 33 AD, maybe late 33 AD. And his first Jerusalem visit, would, that would make it three years later when he went, and that would put it in the fall of 36, around, just a, around. And um, you remember when he went to Jerusalem, they wouldn't receive him, and he was under persecution, so they sent him back to, uh, to his home city. Of, and um, while he was there, these are the, the silent years that we don't really know about, but he was for sure preaching, which we'll come to that later. And um, then Barnabas, it seems about AD 44, uh, about eight years later, Barnabas goes, collects him, takes him down to Antioch. Uh, while in Antioch, there's the prophet Agabus who says that the saints in Jerusalem are going to suffer from a famine. Paul goes down there in about AD 45 on a famine relief visit. And um, then he begins his first missionary journey, which is what we're going to look at now, about probably the spring of about A.D. 47, right, roundabout. So if it's the spring of A.D. 47 and he's converted in A.D. 33, it's what, what is it, about 14 years later? Am I right? That he, he kicks off. And this is the wonderful story of the first missionary journey, and let's take it in your Bibles, in Acts chapter 13. Now, in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Notice that at this stage, the Barnabas is called a prophet and a teacher. Later on, we'll see him called an apostle, but at this stage, they're called prophets and teachers. It was a general appellation anyway. Um, and um, Simeon, who was called Niger, that's uh, interesting. Niger means black. This person, Niger was uh, black-skinned. He was undoubtedly of African descent. Um, or, anyway. Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So Saul was there. We remember that um, he had come down with Barnabas. Now verse 2 is interesting. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I've called them. A couple of things here. Firstly, notice the order. Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas is still the leading figure at this stage in the eyes especially of the church that's at Jerusalem and the church that's at Antioch. He was the most well-known. He was the leading man. Now, question. How does the Holy Spirit speak? Well, it can be through prophecy. It can be, but it not always is. But in this case, I wonder, who's, I wonder who spoke. Did it come 
directly to Paul, directly to Barnabas. How do you experience the Holy Spirit speaking to you? In an audible voice? I've only ever heard the audible voice of God twice in my life, like you can hear me now. And uh, so that's going back a bit. Um, but yet, the Holy Spirit speaks in other ways. I'm going to tell you a story. I might have told you, but I want to tell you this story because in sometimes, some churches go into fanaticism. And of course, when I say some, I'm talking about Holy Ghost churches. Uh, when I was back in Sydney, way back in the 60s, two ladies stopped on a boat and a uh, boat was stopping. They'd come from America. And they came into the church and while they're in the church, the Holy Spirit spoke to the pastor a message for them. He didn't know about them, but God said to them through him, God has not called you to India. Now what had happened with these ladies? Well, when they'd been in church, it was a church back in America, little church, and there were two so-called prophetesses who used to hold hands and dance around the church and lay hands on people and prophesy over them. Now, don't dance around me and prophesy over me, please. <laughs> but that's what they did. And these two ladies came to these other two ladies, laid hands on them, prophesied, said, God has called you as missionaries to India. So what did they do? They believed it. They sold everything they had. And they got on a boat, and they got as far as Sydney in Australia. And it wasn't until they got there that the Lord told them that they'd been hoaxed. A good thing to do when people say to you that the Spirit is uh, telling you this, is to say, well, when the Spirit says that to me, we'll both know. It, um, how does the Spirit speak? My experience has been sometimes the Holy Spirit surprises. Um, the very first time that it came, something came to me from the Lord, I was in Sydney, Australia, and I had a, my job was I was a sales representative. And I liked that job. I was traveling all over Sydney and uh, visiting vet. Yeah, I was a sales representative for a company that made furniture. And um, it was great. So I'm there, and I'm sitting. It was lunchtime. I remember it so vividly. And I pulled the car over into a parking spot, and it's in Bodney Bay. If you know Bodney Bay in Sydney, I'm looking over Bodney Bay, eating my lunch, and suddenly a spirit of nostalgia came over me that this is the last time I'd be leaving in Sydney. It was like I'd gone from Sydney, and... Uh, and that's what happened. Very shortly after that, I went to Canberra where the church, a, a maid of mine was opening a church to help him. So the Spirit speaks in different ways. Um, that same, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you this as instance. Uh, that same guy I went to help the church in Canberra in 1968, in 1971, I was in England and I, I didn't know what to do. I, I wasn't sh And for the first time, time in my life, I prayed four hours solid. Now, maybe you regularly pray four hours solid, but I had never done that. 
But I said, I felt to say this to the Lord. Lord, I want the place that I should be. I want the people say to me, Mike, we want you, and Mike, we need you here. Do you know, I believe it was the very next morning I got a letter from Canberra, and it said the very same thing. Mike, we want you, and we need you here. So, God will direct your prayers for direction sometimes. This is another way the Spirit speaks. I remember uh, my good friend Bill Dross, to, uh, when he, they were in South America and they had phenomenal success. The whole of Colombia had opened up to them and then Ecuador and other places. And um, the family were there, they all spoke Spanish, the boys had gone to school in Spanish. But the Holy Spirit put it on Bill's heart to go to Malaga, in, to, to go to Spain, he didn't know where. So he, he said to his wife and family, the Spirit is directing me to go to Spain. And guess what? Every one of them said, no way. It's not possible. We are here, the Holy Spirit's moving, phenomenal results. And um, so Bill was very wise. He said, okay. He said, I'm going to go to Spain, and I'm just going to leave it to the Lord. So he took off, and he went to Spain. And the first day he's in Spain, he's in Madrid, and he's walking around, and he, he bumps into somebody out of nowhere. And this guy turns, and they get talking, and this guy turns out to be an American. And he's an American missionary. And as they're having the conversation, this American young man, missionary, says, he said, look, I thought God was calling me to Spain, but I now realize, now I realize that God is not calling me to Spain. So he said, I've got a camping van. He took the keys out of his pocket. He said, it's yours. He gave him the keys to his camping van. Isn't that God? So now Bill is there in Spain and he has a camping van. But he still doesn't know where to go. And so for nearly three months, is driving all over Spain, praying for God's direction, and it, it just doesn't feel led anywhere. And then, right towards the end of the journey, it's night time, and uh, he's picked up a hitchhiker. He'd always pick up hitchhikers, because he you know, can share the gospel with them. And as they're driving in Andalusia, in southern Spain, in the distance, they were in the hills, uh, uh, and um, way down in the distance, there were the lights twinkling of a city on the coast. And so Bill says to the hitchhiker, he says, uh, he says, son, he said, look at the map, tell me what city that is. And the guy looks at the map and he says, oh, it's Mal Malaga. And then suddenly it hit him. Years and years before, they'd been in Ecuador and they'd had evangelizations and they were in a, a, a remote forest of the Amazon. And um, a lady had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and when she was baptized in the Spirit, she spoke in English, Malaga needs this gospel, Malaga needs this gospel. Well, they'd taken a mission team to Malaga and uh, nothing happened. It was a remote place and they couldn't figure it out. And they'd forgotten all about it. It was years back. But then, when that boy said to him, it's Malaga, it all came flooding back. And uh, he knew that was a place that the Spirit was directing him to. And so when he gets home, Guess what? All the boys and his wife said, the Lord's spoken to us, yes, we're going to Spain. 
It's wonderful the way the Holy Spirit can really direct us. But sometimes in life you, you really need clear direction. Especially when you're changing places and going somewhere else. There was another time, uh, I'll, I'll cl close that with this, um, or this study. Uh, of, um, back in 70, 72, 73, I woke up in the morning and music was going through my head. Uh, now is the hour for we to say goodbye. So, you know the Maori farewell, soon you'll be going far across the sea. I knew it was a far Maori farewell. I don't know music, but at least I knew that was a Maori farewell. I said, hey, wait on. I'm in Australia. This, it, like, when I say it wouldn't leave my head, I'm talking about for three or four hours, the whole morning. Can't get it out of my head. Sometimes this is the way God speaks too. You just can't get it out of your head. I said, New Zealand? Songs Maoris? Maoris live in New Zealand? New Zealand's far across the sea from Australia? Very shortly after that, I was asked to go as a relieving missionary to New Zealand. Uh, I, mean, I, I think it was in the week. And of course I said yes. Because uh, the moral of the story is God guides clearly when he needs to, especially about ministry and about changing your location. There was a wonderful book written by a man called Bob Munford. Anybody read it? Take another look at Guidance. I remember reading it back in, uh, I think it was about 79, and it was the best book I've ever read about how the Holy Spirit guides you. I went on to Amazon the other day out of curiosity. Unfortunately, it's out of print. And if you want to buy a second-hand one, it's about 160 US dollars. So you, you won't be able to get it. But it's the best book on guidance I know. Anyway, let's go on. The Holy Spirit speaks. That is for sure. But he doesn't speak like those ladies bouncing around and uh, you've got to be very, very careful. So, then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. Now, they didn't lay hands on them. Or they were already ordained as ministers, but they, they laid hands to say, you've got the blessing of the church. We're going with you. You know, whenever... God calls you to do something. It's good to get the blessing. Absolutely. If you don't get, you know, there's been too many people that have made too many mistakes that have shot out on their own. So, oh, God's directing me even though you don't think about it. And uh, in time they've come to nothing. And even more, perhaps lost money and uh, 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 and lost credibility and lost everything, other things. So, being, look at verse 4, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, that is the key to everything. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Men can send you out, but unless it's the Spirit that sends you out as well as men, you may not prosper. You, it's got to be the whole, whatever we do, it's got to be in the Spirit. So, when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. That, Paul always went there, always to the synagogue. They also had John, that's John Mark, as their assistant. And when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, son of 
son of Jesus. Cyprus was the original home of Barnabas, and Salamis was the main city on the east coast. So Paul's following his usual strategy, goes to the synagogue. And then they went through the island, and that term went through usually means they went through preaching. And they got to the capital, Paphos, capital of the island. It was infamous for its worship of Venus. Venus was the goddess of sexual love. Athanasius styled its religion the deification of lust. So this is where they get to. Uh, Bar Jesus meant the son of salvation. And there, let's read on. Who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimas the sorcerer, for so is his name by translation, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul from the faith. You know the devil always does that. I can remember when I was working uh, on prophecy in Britain and with, with the politicians and other people trying to tell them that about the EU, um, that there was, it was actually outside the, um, the conference of the Conservative Party when they were having their annual conference. There was a guy there that came and started shouting and screaming uh, down because I was giving out literature and so on, opposing. Whenever, or many, many times, when God tries to speak to people, Satan will send somebody to oppose that. Then Saul, who's called Paul. Notice this. Saul has a Roman name as well as a Jewish name. He was a Roman citizen. So, Saul, Paul, it's the same. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And from now on in the book of Acts, it's not Saul, it's Paul. This is how totally Paul identified himself with the people that he was going to minister to. He never, ever after that, in letters or any other way, referred to himself as Saul. You may remember the story of the missionaries to China. There was a, the famous missionaries, anyway, they, that when they went to China, they thought, we'll have success if we dress like the locals, if we wear our hair, I'm talking about in the 19th century now, if we wear our hair like the locals, so they, what is known, was known then as the China Inland Mission was an incredible inspiration to people. And they had phenomenal success in the latter half of the uh, 1900s in China. They, because instead of appearing totally foreign, they tried to identify with the people that they were ministering to. Anyway. Saul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, you need to repent. You're wrong. Don't do this. Not at all, he said. Oh, fall of all deceit and fraud. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Now indeed the hand of the Lord's upon you, and you'll be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a mist came on him. And from being the man whom they said was the power of God, and influencing the head of the island, he was begging for somebody to show him around. And the verse 12, the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. What's the moral of all these stories? 
you need, we need the power of God. We need the gifts of the Holy Ghost. We, especially when it comes to evangelizing in new areas. But God has to be with you to work. So now the proconsuls believed. The gospel's been planted on Cyprus. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. You want to look at your map there? You'll see the island of Cyprus. On, as you're looking at it, on the left-hand side, you see the capital Paphos. And so they sailed across the sea to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Luke never recorded while, why John left, and we don't know. We can speculate. Maybe he didn't like them going to the Gentiles. Maybe, maybe, maybe. All kind of maybes. We don't know. But what we do know is that Paul never forgot this. Why did he run home and he didn't even go back to Antioch where they'd been sent out from? He went home to Jerusalem where his mother had a big house. Why did he run back to Mama? I don't know. He was the, uh, of course, they were related, Barnabas and John. Let's go on with the story. When they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, as uh, somebody noted. There are two Antiochs. There's Antioch in Syria, where they were sent out from, which was the big Christian center. And Antioch in Pisidia is the first place they come to when they get to the mainland of Turkey. And they went into the synagogue of Seven and sat down. After the reading of the law, the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue met them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Ah, now, obviously, these strangers that came into the synagogue were Jewish. Paul looked Jewish. So did his mate. And they had a reputation. So they were asked to speak. Look at... Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen, the God of our, this people Israel, chose our fathers. And it goes on in a long story about the history of the Jewish nation. And he goes right up, look at verse 29. When they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, that is Jesus, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. Took him down from the tree. That was an allusion to Deuteronomy that said, Cursed is everybody that hangs on a tree. Christ became a curse for us that we may be blessed. And Paul went on, through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. This was always his message. For the Jew, they had it in mind, it was their law, it was circumcision, it was keeping of the law that made them right with God. But the message was, it's been superseded through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And he goes on to quote, uh, he quotes from Habakkuk, Behold, you despise us, marvel and perish. So when the Jews, verse 42, went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So this phenomenal success Phenomenal. Many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And on the next Sabbath, 
Almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Can you imagine if almost the whole city of Cairns came to church on Sunday? That be it, it, it's unimaginable these days, isn't it? Unimaginable. And yet, back in the days of the revival in Melbourne in 1902, I think it was, they had to get the, the, um, the great stadium there. And they had three services a day. A quarter of a million people came to the revival meetings when the whole state of Victoria had only a million people. Over the years. What's happened to Australia? What's happened to England? What's happened to Europe? We are so far from the days of revival. What's happened to Wales? God help us, we need. We, well, we need revival and miracles, hallelujah. Amen. So, almost the whole city. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. One of the worst things we have to deal with is envy. Contradicting and blaspheming, they oppose the things spoken of Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas. Notice, it started off as Barnabas and Paul, but now it's always Paul and Barnabas. It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Make no mistake, there are not two Gospels. The Jews need to turn to Jesus. There's no salvation by staying a Jew. If there is, there was no Paul, point in Paul preaching. There's just no point. Jesus has superseded the law, fulfilled it, and superseded it. And that's the message we have. And um, I'm sorry, but I've got to phrase this right. All this business about it doesn't matter what you believe, so long as you believe in some religion, is, is without salvation. The Christian message is, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. And that was the impetus for the disciples to go into all the world. Uh, Paul speaking to them said, look, he said, in time past, speaking to the Gentiles, God winked at your ignorance. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. The sad thing about our day is we are deliberately closing our ears and our eyes and our hearts to all that's come before us and to the preaching of the gospel. And that's the reality of the day in which we live. So what's our response? Well, we get with it. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Don't be intimidated. Hallelujah. So, the Lord's commanded us, saying, I've sent you, set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Oh, hallelujah. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as being appointed to eternal life believed. Now, that's not talking about predestination. It's just the, the way the, 
did the phrase, and he was talking about the Gentiles. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the region. That's why they went to the major cities. When you converted in the major cities, people would believe, and those people would live all around the area, and they'd spread the message. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women, and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. They, they used the devout Jewish women to speak to their husbands and bring pressure against them. But they shook the dust from off their feet and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Iconium was on the great highway. It was about 100 miles southeast of Antioch. So Antioch in Pisidia is up there. It was about 135 miles from Perga. And then they come down and they go to, and the, they come down into Iconium. Well, let's go on with the story at Iconium. Nothing would stop them. Nothing. Now it happened in Iconium that they went to together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed a great multitude. Fant fantastic. But, and here again, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. But the devil always works the same way. He's trying to poison mind against the message. And because a great multitude, in verse 1, had believed, the disciples stayed a long time because there was opposition, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it. I wonder how they became aware of it. Somebody told them. Somebody who was sympathetic heard what was going on and said, look, they're going to stone you. Now, they, it was totally illegal to stone them. They were Roman citizens. They had to be brought to trial and found guilty of death before they could be touched. But you know what? If you can get the mob to move, you can do something and it's too late to do anything when somebody's dead, isn't it? And that was their tactic. And it's always the devil's tactic. So they fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycaonia and the surrounding regions. So if you look at your map, you'll see where they fled to. They went again south from Iconium to Lystra. But, <laughs> have you ever fled? Fled means they moved with great haste, hardly stopping to get their possessions. Otherwise, it was going to be death. But you know what? You, don't, you know what happened when they got to Lystra? They were fleeing, being stoned. But the irony was, when they got to Lystra, that was the very place Paul was going to be stoned. Let's read on. <clears throat> they fled, verse 6, to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycaonia, and the surrounding region. And they were there preaching the gospel. 
and in Lystra. A certain man without strength in his feet was sitting a cripple from his mother's womb who never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet! And he leaped and walked. Wow! He never ever stood! But he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lachaonian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus. Zeus was the chief of the gods. Barnabas must have looked the most distinguished. And uh, Paul Hermes, because uh, Hermes was the speaker, and uh, Paul was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitude. Now, you've got to know a bit of the history to understand what was going on here. Because there was a legend in Lystra that once Zeus and Hermes visited the area disguised as beggars. And as these beggars went around knocking on a thousand doors, nobody gave them hospitality except a very old, very poor peasant couple. Philemon was the name of the guy and his wife, Bosis. And um, this they had hardly anything themselves, but they took them in. This was a legend. And they gave them something to eat. And they gave them from little wine they had in a bowl, and they noticed that when they drank the wine, the bowl filled itself up with wine again. And then they realized, it's the gods! And the gods led them out to a hill and destroyed the whole area other than this old couple. And as this old couple looked down, I'm telling you, stories in the Roman poets. Their humble little shack was turned into a great marble temple with a golden roof. So, they, everybody in Lystra knew this story. So here comes Paul and Barnabas, and they've never seen anything like it. They pray, and this man, everybody knew he'd been a cripple from his mother's womb, jumped up and leaped. Now Paul and Barnabas, of course, they didn't know the local language, and all this is going on, and the people are running, and they're, they're thinking, what's going on? And when they realize that these people are looking to them as gods and they want to sacrifice, they did what every good Jew would do. When he hears blasphemy, from the top of his tunic, he rips it down. They rip down. And so, because the people spoke Lycaonian as well as Greek, and Paul said, why are you doing these things? We're men the same nature as you, preach to you that you should turn from these useless things of the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all things that are therein. Notice that when Paul and Barnabas spoke to the Gentiles, they never made reference to Jewish history. They had to speak in a different way to try to reach them. Uh, nevertheless, he didn't leave himself without witness, and so on. And um, it says in verse 18, with even speaking to them like this, they could scarcely restrain the multitude from sacrificing to them. What a story. No. Oh. But then, 
Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. And having persuaded the multitude, the multitude is always fickle. They'd seen the miracle, what wanted to worship them, and now they persuade the multitude. They blasphemed! Blasphemed the Roman gods, they said. And so now, what do they do? What does the next verse tell you? They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, I'm pretty sure he was dead, because when you're stoned, you're dead. And the way they stoned, they, did, they didn't take little pebbles. <laughs> They threw you down to the ground, and if you weren't dead because they'd thrown, normally they'd throw you off a, a great height, they'd take a great rock and smash it on your heart. And if you were still breathing, then everybody would get around and throw the biggest stone they could at you. You were dead. So they weren't talking about throwing little pebbles. And the disciples came and they gathered round him. I don't believe to pray that he'd be alive, but just to commiserate. So I think, what are we going to do now? However, when the disciples gathered round him, he rose up and went into the city. Spirit of life came back to him. You're not going to die until it's your time to die. When John was in Ephesus towards the end of his life, the Romans ordered that he be boiled alive in oil. And the story was they couldn't kill him. I've... Anyway. The disciples gathered round and he rose up it's phenomenal, this story. I mean, we're not talking about one miracle. Yeah, the list of, but God's working all time and time and time again. And now here's a man who's been stoned and he gets up, shakes himself, dusts, dusts himself off, and walks back to the city where they've stoned him. Now, if it would have been me, I wouldn't have walked back to the city where they'd stoned me. I'd take off the other direction. <laughs> Paul was a phenomenal fellow. You talk about being unintimidated. He went back to the city and the next day departed with Barnabas to Derby. I wonder what Barnabas was thinking. Oh, well, well, anyway. And <laughs> they go to Derby now. Nothing will stop them. <laughs> and when they preached the gospel in Derby and made many disciples. Don't you know that this was the man that they stoned in Lystra who rose from the dead? What a testimony! They returned to Lystra. Hey, what? Am I reading it right? So they were in Derby and they preached there and when they made many disciples, they didn't take the easy route back home. They went back to Lystra, checking the disciples. You guys doing all right? You're well? You're serving the Lord? You're praising the Lord? You're making disciples? You're not intimidated? Hallelujah! Paul and Barnabas go back to them. <laughs> and then to Iconium. 
and Antioch in Pisidia. And, uh, if you've got your map, you'll see it was quite a walk from all these places. Antioch in Pisidia, we said, was about 135 miles from Perga. I mean, these guys, they were walking days and days and days to preach the gospel. Some, some preachers won't go to a place to preach unless they're given at least a business class ticket by air and a five-star hotel. I, I mean, I've, if, you're, if you're a big-name preacher and you try to get somebody to come to your church as a big name, they'll send you a form saying, um, if they're thinking about it, they'll send... No, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying how it is today and comparing it with how it was before that these great men of God kept on. Hallelujah. So they went back strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continuing the faith, and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Well, Paul was a living testimony what they'd done to him. But you know, seeing that they came through it gave them faith that they too could go through it. So, they were strengthening the disciples. So when they'd appointed elders in every church and prayed with, fasted, with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they'd believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia and sailed from there to Antioch where the mission had commenced and they'd been commended to the grace of God. So if you see on the second map that you've got, they sailed directly to Antioch. So there we are. When they'd gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he'd opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Notice that. It's the door of faith. Not the door of the Jewish law. The Gentiles had not needed to become Jewish proselytes. As before they had needed to be, to attend the synagogue, if they wouldn't become, if, you know, if they wouldn't go through circumcision and all the Jewish rites of the law, they may be be known as God-fearers. They were, you know, kind of a lower down tier. Um, but now, Paul and Barnabas had put aside all of that. You don't need it. It is by faith they just preached Jesus, baptized them, prayed for them to be filled with the Holy Ghost. God had opened the door of faith. So, they stayed a long time with the disciples. So, we can figure they got back, hmm, around about 40, 48, they will probably have got back there uh, on, from their first journey, maybe 47. So, they're there a long time. With this. What's happening? People are rejoicing. Hallelujah. Amen. Fantastic. No. The legalists in Jerusalem, the people that know better, the, uh, the, these are Christians. These are Pharisees that have become Christians. Started talking amongst themselves. Hey. This Paul... He's not teaching them that they need the law anymore. That they need to be proselytes before they become Christians. He's wrong. They've got to be proselytes 
They've got to follow the Jewish law. And you know what? They, they sent emissaries right back up into where Paul had been and Barnabas and Syria and everywhere, disturbing the churches, disturbing the faith, and telling them, we're from Jerusalem. Actually, they weren't from Jerusalem. They, they were from Judea. They'd not been sent by the Jerusalem church, but they claimed that they had. And they went all around undermining what Paul and Barnabas had done. The devil's always trying to undermine the work of God. So how does Paul respond? I can imagine when he started getting news, started hearing things, people coming from those places, saying what was happening, he went ballistic. He went so ballistic that he wrote the book of Galatians. Now some people think the Galatians is later, but I, I'm sure that's not right. It doesn't fit. The very first epistle that Paul wrote was the book of Galatians. I couldn't and didn't have time to go back to these churches for the moment, but he penned off Galatians. And um, whenever you read Galatians, read it in that context that the Judaizers have been trying to destroy all that he's done. See, it's Paul's. He starts off Paul in Galatians 1, an apostle not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Grace to you, tra-la-la, tra, -la -la, tra -la. And in verse 6, I marvel that you're turning away from him so soon who called you to the grace of God to a different gospel. Uh, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you, want to pervert the gospel of Christ, but even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that we preach you, let him be accursed. As we said before, I say again, if anyone preach any other gospel, and then he goes on to justify himself. Pretty strong stuff. This is Paul gone ballistic in the power of the Holy Ghost because he knows what's happening and what's at stake. What's at stake is the whole conversion of the Gentiles. And the, now, but you've got to get, try to understand this, that the people that were doing this were Christians. They were believers. Yes, they were Believers that had turned from the sect of the Pharisees, but they were, they were convinced they were right. They were convinced that Paul was wrong. You know, sometimes disputes arise because there are people that are so hard-headed, they think they are right, and they don't care like somebody else cares. I've seen it a lot of times in my life that there are many people that don't really have pastoral hearts that only care about disbelief. I've seen people, well, you've probably come across them yourself. And this is what was happening. It's not of the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't of the Holy Spirit. But it seemed to be. Because these people, they were Pharisees. They were Christians. We are steeped in the... Anyway, so we've got to read on. And we, we'll understand now. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brothers. 
Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. They went, they'd already sent the emissaries through the other churches, but they had the gall to come to Antioch, this Gentile, basically a Gentile church, and say that to them. Satan is, Satan is nothing if not bold. People can really be driven and they don't know what they're being driven by. You know, we've always got to be careful about what's driving us. We have to be. Satan likes nothing better than to divide and conquer. I've seen people leave churches for the most trivial reasons. I say, I think to myself, don't you know what spirit is behind you? And you know they don't. That's the problem. They get blinded by things. And this is what we're reading. Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of, of Moses. See, they're calling on Moses. According Moses. Who's this Paul compared to Moses? You cannot be saved. Now, Paul, Barnabas, you know, they preach the same message we do, believe in Jesus. So, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them. You understand that diplomatic language of saying, no small dissension and dispute. That means there were almighty arguments. I mean, there was fire and brimstone. It was. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about the question. Now, they'd already, these Judaizers, They'd already heard that Paul had had the temerity to write an epistle to all these people, telling them that they didn't need what they were saying. Who was it that had been stoned? Who was it, was it that had preached to them and been persecuted? Well, it was Paul and it was Barnabas. But there's always somebody on the sidelines not suffered. Don't know what it's all about. Oh, you need us to teach you. Is that right? That's why Paul said you got 10,000 teachers but not many fathers. Uh, praise God. So, this is the background and they sent to Jerusalem, to the apostles and elders about the question. Now, what was agitating the Judaizers was they knew that their authority was going away. So, being sent on their way, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles and cause great joy to the brethren. There's a difference, isn't there? When people are encouraging, they bring joy. When people are critical and doing their own thing, they bring dissension and disunity and disquiet and misery. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed just said it time and time again. Just because you believe, just because you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, 
doesn't mean to say all your theology is right and all your motivations are right. They said it's necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, again, diplomatic language, there had been almighty arguments. Peter rose up, said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now this had been some years before. You would think that the matter had been settled when Peter went, but it wasn't. They just couldn't take it. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Hallelujah. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul. Notice that Paul and Barnabas up till this time had not spoken to the multitude. They were wise to let the others have the Barney and Peter speak. But then Barnabas and Paul declared how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James, now James is the half-brother of the Lord, James the Just said. Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon's declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophet agree, just as it is written. After this I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, and so on. He quotes Amos 9. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, sexual immorality, things strangled and from blood. I eat bacon with my eggs in the hotel, but I don't eat blood sausage. From blood. Never, because I think this principle still applies. Yeah. Things strangled and from blood. Um, it bothers me sometimes when I go through Asia and I see all these uh, chooks and, and um, ducks strangled and hanging in the place. Because I, I remember when we were kids, we used to go around to see the Jewish people and um, they'd take the chickens and they'd be a very simple man. Uh, the, the, the Jewish people, uh, they, they'd always give jobs to you know, to their own people, but the and he'd be there with a chicken, take it, and with a great axe, chop its head off, <coughs> and throw the chicken to the side. They'd, the Jewish people would never strangle chickens, because it, the blood stays in the body. And, um, yeah, anyway. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogue every Sabbath. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church 
to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they wrote the same thing to them. And they sent it by word of mouth with these brethren from Jerusalem too. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, gathered the multitude, delivered the letters. When they'd read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Who knows that God always wants to encourage you? Yeah. He doesn't want to discourage you. God always wants to encourage you. Ah. <sighs> Now, Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets also, exhorted, strengthened the brethren with many words. After they'd stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. That's the apostles back in Jerusalem. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. I wonder why Silas remained there. God put it on his heart. He didn't, Silas didn't know why he, why he was staying there. He just thought, oh, I, I like it here. I've got some ministry here, I'll just stay here. But of course, the Holy Spirit foresaw what was going to happen next with Paul and Barnabas and prepared for it. Who knows that God always prepares things, though you may not be aware of it. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of God and many others also. So Paul and Barnabas are back there. They've been pioneering and I can imagine what Paul's feeling. Oh, there are so many teachers here. They don't need us. We are superfluous to requirements. And there's a whole Gentile world out there that needs the gospel. So it's stirring in Paul's heart again. So Paul says to Barnabas, let's now go back, visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing pastor's heart. Let's go back and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they shouldn't take him with them because he departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention between them was so sharp Paul, when he wanted to be, knew how to stand his ground. Mark was the nephew of Barnabas. And Barnabas seems to be a more warm-hearted, accommodating man than Paul. Paul's like this. He's like a laser. And he says to Barnabas, he said, look, he didn't stay with us last time. He's not qualified. We can't trust him. And Barnabas, he said, no, but you give him a chance, Paul. He was just a young bloke. He's learned. Bum, bum. Disputes always arise one way or another. The contention was so sharp, they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed. It doesn't say that um, Barnabas and Mark were commended by the brethren to the grace of God, but Paul and Silas were. And so they went on and they started their second missionary journey. And here, folks, we have to end it until next week, God willing. But any questions or comments before we close? I just want to say thank you for good stories. And it was a lot of good 
Yeah. Yeah. See. Um, Sounds like you were there, Mike. <laughs> the, the moral of the story to us, uh, the moral of the story to me is, there can always be sensions, dissensions and disputes and stuff, you see. But you shouldn't get discouraged because it is, after all, just human nature. And in it all, God is working his purpose out. Lord, thank you. The more we get to know about Paul, the more we love him and just see what a, what a singular soul he was. And down the ages there have been singular souls. And we want, Lord, we want to be part of the Great Commission. And we want you to use us. And we need the working of miracles in our life, especially in these days that it's, Europe is called post-Christian now. They need to see the miracle working God and their words, the words of the gospel, need to go forward. Help us to that end in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Well, God bless you, folks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your time.